Um, uh, John, thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, I come from a tradition where the Talmud teaches that a debt is never repaid unless it's discharged publicly. Uh, John Bowman was a graduate student, brilliant graduate student, at the University of Chicago when I taught there. And um, he taught me a lesson. Um, I don't think I've ever publicly um, credited you with this, uh, but the most important lesson in social science, I think, that I've ever learned, which is that there's only one good question. And that question is, under what conditions? Um, John wrote a, a, a stunning first book based on a thesis, which was about why it is that capitalists, um, principally in the mining industry, as I remember, um, uh, they have essentially, I'll stylize, have three choices. They can compete, which and firms do compete with each other. They try to sometimes put each other out of business. They can collude, or they can invoke government to come and um, establish regulations um, which protect the industry. And his question, as I understood it then and still do, was under what conditions? Um, and in a way, this talk on is liberal socialism possible, which is a form of reflections on real utopias, um, is asking that question, um, under, under what conditions? Um, as I begin, I can't also help but express a, a debt to um, Fred and Magali and Will and Gay and others who, who brought us together today, John, um, and to the, the journal, to this institution, the New School, but the journal Politics and Society, which has been a, um, uh, an uncommonly powerful site of intellectual networking about questions that matter for many, many decades. Peter, as well. I mean, there's a, the gang here is just great to see. And, um, uh, and, and of course, um, uh, Marsha and Becky and Jenny had to um, deal with the fact that we intruded. And, um, uh, but it was never an intrusion. It was always an embrace with love. Now. For all these reasons, it's a great honor to speak here um, this evening. Um, this is a chance to celebrate a remarkable person and an astonishing scholar by reflecting on a question that helped animate, I believe, Eric's beautiful and brilliant writings on class as well as the real Utopia's initiative. In his words, that project embraced, quote, a tension between dreams and practice. Its work, Eric continued, was founded on the belief that what is pragmatically possible is not fixed independently of our imaginations, but is itself shaped by our visions. Now that program sought to understand and curb the mendacious advantages conferred to property and class position that contribute to an erosion of the content, the meaning, and the standing of liberal democracy. As a matter of realism and utopianism, the question I should like to probe is this. Is liberal socialism possible? A positive reply, alas, deeply uncertain, is needed more than ever. Thus, it's important to ask about the conditions of vision and imagination that is, to identify stipulations that might advance an appealing engagement of the complex liberal and socialist traditions whose relationship has principally, principally been a history, at best, of prickly relations, each, not without reason, almost never quite comfortable with the other. Wrestling with terms of connect, these terms of connection is not new. Just over a century ago, the grand 11th edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica, 29 volumes, 40,000 entries, devoted a very long account to socialism, written by the Scottish historian and student of political economy, James Bonner, who had lectured on economics to workers in London's East End and served as a senior civil servant in Whitehall. That essay is charged with contradictory language. 
noting that, quote, the leading idea of the socialist is to convert into general benefit what is now the gain of the few, Bonner underscored how socialists wish, and I quote, to employ the compulsory powers of the sovereign state. Such powers, he wrote, are dangerous to political liberalism. Quote, a strong central government to which all power is given over the chief industries in the country would be contrary to liberty. Our leaders would be too likely to become again our masters. Great powers would be a temptation, an unavoidable temptation to abuse power, end quote. Notwithstanding, the essay went on to favorably cite the goal enunciated by the new liberal Thomas Hill Green, T.H. Green, in his 1881 book, Liberal Legislation and Freedom of Contract. Green wrote that it is, quote, the business of the state to maintain the conditions without which a free exercise of the human faculties is impossible. The text also highlighted how Sir William Harcourt, liberal chancellor of the exchequer under Gladstone, declared in 1888, we are all socialists now. Bonner closed by insisting that under conditions of strong liberal representative government, quote, socialism, whatever its precise complexion, need have no terrors. It too will represent the people at its best. Thus, this was a choppy call, more than a bit uncertain for liberal socialism. But where, more than a century later, can we find successful empirical examples? Painfully, very few come to mind. Perhaps the closest to arguably to qualify was the post-war Labor Party government led by Clement Attlee. With the social democracy of an expanded welfare state, including national health, extended into the nationalization of the railroads, as well as coal, steel, iron. As it turned out, though, none of the socialization of the commanding heights of the British economy lasted. The question persists, is liberal socialism possible? On what terms? These puzzles are at least as imperative today as when Carlo Rosselli, imprisoned off the coast of Sicily for his anti-fascism, wrote Socialismo Liberale in 1928 and early 1929, and I apologize to Magali for my Italian, opposing what he called the solitude of tyranny, the movement Rosselli founded after escaping to Paris in 1929, Justice and Liberty, was based on voluntarism and freedom, parliamentary democracy and pluralism, that is, on political liberalism, a complex body of thought and institutions that shares commitments to the rule of law, government by consent, individual and public rights, and political representation. Without those four characteristics, there's no such thing as political liberalism. It was, Rosselli argued, a revolutionary liberalism that, quote, put the passwords of liberty and democracy first in conjunction with strong socialist aspirations. Neither sectarian nor dogmatic, but open-ended and imaginative, Rosselli's quest for liberal socialism announced aspirations for a democratic left that have yet to be surpassed. Rosselli was a real utopian. At the center of his thought and politics was the belief against odds that a transformative reorganization of political, social, and economic institutions through a combination of liberalism and socialism, might rescue the best of both traditions from the larger thuggery represented in 1937, not only by Mussolini in Rome, but by Hitler in Berlin, by Stalin in Moscow, in the era of Nuremberg Laws and Kristallnacht, show trials, and the Great Terror. Soon enough, National Socialism and Stalinism's illiberal socialism organized unprecedented killing fields. Rosselli's convictions proved dangerous. A martyr to liberal socialism, 
His voice was stilled in June 1937, soon after he had fought against Franco alongside Spanish anarchists. That month, as many of you know, he was assassinated in northwest France alongside his brother Nello by killers sent by Mussolini who murdered them, them both. When I read Rosselli, it's impossible not to hear the vibrant voice of Eric Olin Wright, one of the most noble, intellectual, political, and scholarly figures of our time. Synonyms for the word noble include these, generous, magnanimous, eminent, dignified, chivalrous, great-hearted, high-minded, honorable, distinguished, tolerant, gracious, beneficent. Is there even one of those designations that does not fit the person we're here to celebrate and whom many of us were privileged to know? Eric, as you know, launched Real Utopias in 1991, two years before John Rawls introduced his own cognate term, realistic utopias. Eric underscored the need to combat cynicism and hopelessness generated by often ugly contemporary trends, moving beyond abstract formulations to institutional designs geared to alter probabilities. He designated a field of tension composed by the intersection of moral values and institutional details. Much like the articles, published at a different and even more ugly moment in the early 1930s by the Journal of Rosselli's Justice and Liberty Movement, an older cousin, as it were, to Eric's cherished politics and society. Liberalism, wrote Rosselli, is the most straightforward, in the most straightforward sense, and I'm quoting, can be defined in the political theory that takes the inner freedom of the human spirit as a given and adopts liberty as the ultimate goal, but also the ultimate means, the ultimate means, the ultimate rule of shared human life. We know, of course, that Eric was devoted passionately and intellectually to what he designated as socialist alternatives, an ambition he articulated in many places, including a fall 2006 article in New Left Review that sketched his commitment to an emancipatory social science. Any of us privileged to have spent time in Madison at the Haven Center, or to have worked with Eric on the editorial board of the journal, or to have interacted in multiple registers with this rigorous yet playful person, cannot but recognize his affiliation with and commitment to Rosselli's understanding that at its best, Liberalism is not just a set of ideas or institutional designs, but especially in dark times, it is what he called, Rosselli called, the ultimate means of shared human life. Rosselli and Wright both rejected the claim made famous in the 1940s by Hayek that unalloyed free market capitalism and political liberalism have no choice but to be mutually constitutive. Rosselli observed, disconcertingly, that when a choice had been offered or had been made between capitalism and liberalism, quote, all over the world, the bourgeoisie are no longer necessarily liberal. The more they try to escape from the discipline and pattern of liberty, end quote. We are familiar with just such doleful choices as anyone who subjects herself to the editorial page of the Wall Street Journal swiftly cannot but recognize. Not just the party that dominates our present <coughs> political order, but a great many of its most privileged supporters seem all too ready to degrade constitutional liberty for the sake of economic deregulation, tax cuts, and uh, tax relief, political guardianship of ever-growing inequalities of income and wealth. Too often, liberal democracy is debased in combination with efforts to secure an unbounded liberty for the most advantaged, notwithstanding the price paid in tangible humiliation and significant deprivation. We might well be inspired in such circumstances by Rosselli's insistence on discerning alternatives at the conjunction of liberalism and socialism, that is, liberalism and socialism at their best, 
The phrase liberal socialism, Rosselli, has a strange sound to many who are accustomed to current political terminology. Nevertheless, he insisted that paths to decent outcomes require, quote, forcing socialists to assume a liberal function in the quite traditional sense of the term. The day will come, he projected, when this word, liberal, will be claimed with proud self-awareness by the socialist. That will be the day of his maturity, the day when he wins emancipation, at least in the domain of the spiritual. Socialism, he understood to be, quote, liberalism in action. It means that liberty comes into the lives of poor people, not just a privileged minority or even a privileged majority, for there is no real liberty for people without a minimum degree of economic autonomy and the chance to escape from the grip of material necessity. But is such liberal socialism possible? Writing as a real utopian, Rosselli insisted how liberalism and socialism, rather than opposing one another in the manner depicted in outdated polemics, and I'm quoting, are connected by an inner bond. Liberalism is the ideal force of inspiration, and socialism is the practical force of realization. Or has the logic and empirical reality of what he called outdated polemics actually won the day? Would that we had hard, compelling empirical evidence that strong political liberalism and strong socialism can successfully conjoin. What you might ask of the Scandinavian welfare states that conjoin selective decommodification with efforts to enhance human and economic security. To be sure, they falsify the Hayekian claim that the welfare state designates a necessary road to serfdom. The practical good achieved by the ethical triumphs of social democracy have not, however, proved to be sufficiently capable counterpunchers to the effects of radical market capitalism. Social democracy is well worth fighting for. It may indeed be the best, perhaps the only available pathway to decent possibilities. But it stops well short of what Rosselli or Eric Wright meant by liberal socialism, and indeed well short of the ambitions that motivated Eric's real utopias project. The question presses, is liberal socialism possible? Deep doubts have not only been expressed on the right. On the democratic left, Karl Polanyi, whose great transformation has been formative for so many of us, had his doubts. Often forgotten is how Polanyi argued that the combination of social democracy and capitalism in the 1920s had helped prepare the way for his era's brutal regimes by interfering with market logic just enough to make capitalism fail, yet not sufficiently to achieve appealing social justice. Sketching alternatives in 1944, Polanyi did not designate Rosselli's vision as a realistic option. He listed only three solutions by, sorry, he only listed three possibilities. Socialism, by which he meant Bolshevism. Fascism, which included Nazism. And what he designated explicitly as the New Deal, a regime whose achievements he admired, not only for rescuing liberal democracy under great stress, but for combining markets with means for society to defend itself against the excessive commodification of land, money, and labor. Notwithstanding its rotten compromises with racism, about which I've written, the New Deal was understood rightly at the time to have global significance. As an indicator, when FDR's presidency was still young, Nehru saluted the president from a British prison cell in Delhi for having come to liberal democracy's rescue. But liberal socialism, the New Deal was not. And today, the term appears for many on the left as utopianism without realism, and for many on the right as a chilling prospect. Still, as was said earlier today, there are fresh openings. Thanks in part to the two national Sanders campaigns. The millionaires and the billionaires, and so on. Um, excuse me. Um, <laughs> 
we're both from Brooklyn, right? The, <laughs> thanks in part to the two national Sanders campaigns and now the Warren campaign, though Warren does not call herself a socialist, democratic, or otherwise, socialism is no longer entirely on the list of proscribed words. Its recrudescence is both welcome and chastening. The latter, because it too often has been accompanied by what I at least consider to be, and not I alone, illiberal immaturity. Jeffrey Isaac has underscored this danger for the left in a number of recent articles. He cites the chilling denunciation by the brilliant chief editor of Jacobin, Vashkar Sunkara, of the decision by the Working Families Party to endorse Elizabeth Warren rather than Bernie Sanders. By doing so, Sinkara wrote, and I quote, the party has written itself out of history. <laughs> Bit much. Um, <laughs> Isaac further understood, underscored how Sinkara's new book, The Socialist Manifesto, meant to be the Communist Manifesto for our time, more broadly elides the culpability of tendencies within Marxism for the crimes committed by Marxist regimes. Quoting a particularly blithe and credulous sentence penned to the effect, and I quote, that having seen 10 million killed in a capitalist war and living in an era of upheaval, the Bolsheviks, he wrote, can be forgiven for trying to chart a course to a better world. Forgiven by whom, we might ask, and why? Now, this ideological insouciance brings to mind the 1943 appraisal of the USSR by Harold Lasky. While acknowledging that Soviet elections were farcical, liberal rights absent, arbitrary arrest, and execution without trial common, Lasky nonetheless lapsed into apologetics. Despite many grave errors, he wrote, the country's rulers did not maintain personal power for its own sake merely. The great end of the revolution remains in being. Unlike fascism, he argued, quote, there is nothing in the nature of the Bolshevik state which is alien from the democratic ideal. And he predicted that once the regime would gain security, its, quote, true character as a genuine search for democracy and freedom will verify itself in experience, end quote. Sankara's manifesto would have done far better to have recalled not Lasky, but the 1989 assessment of Lasky's student, Ralph Miliband, one of the leading Marxist critics of liberal capitalism during the second half of the last century, and one of the earliest international supporters of politics and society. Two decades after publishing The State in Capitalist Society, that brilliant book, Miliband offered, quote, reflections on the crisis of communist regimes an article he published in the New Left Review in 1989. Miliband castigated these governments about to fall for their, quote, savage oppression. And he observed how the system entailed an extreme inflation of state power and correspondingly a stifling of all social forces not controlled by and subservient to the leadership of the party state, end quote writing for an audience of Western socialists, including Marxists of various types, Miliband in effect embraced, though he never would have used this term, a kind of liberal socialism. He closed with, quote, the simple fact of the matter, I'm quoting Miliband, that capitalist democracy, for all its crippling limitations, has been immeasurably less oppressive and a lot more democratic than any communist regime, end quote. Who amongst us would disagree that any recrudescence of socialism must not dance with illiberalism? Thus the question persists, is liberal socialism possible? Is it possible to overcome Orwell's gloomy 1944 observation in his review of Hayek's Road to Serfdom that, quote, such is our present predicament, Capitalism leads to dull cues, the scramble for markets and war. Collectivism leads to concentration camps, leader worship, and war, end quote. He thus asked whether it could be possible to rescue both liberalism and socialism 
from their demonstrated capacities for depredation. Notwithstanding that uncertainty, Orwell insisted that there could be no way out absent the creation of liberal socialist space for what Fritz Stern later called the institutionalization of decency. Strikingly, when Stephen Lukes published a collection of dissident Czech intellectuals in 1985, he observed, not without surprise, that Havel, Hedinek, Benda, and Kusi, in fact, were liberal socialists. Some, Lukes wrote, none, sorry, Lukes wrote, is explicitly unfriendly to the socialist idea or socialist principles. At the same time, each was advancing a thick liberalism based on an active and plural civil society. Perhaps these rebels understood that liberalism on its own lacks sufficient resources with which to pursue egalitarian goals. Their legacy challenges us to ask how egalitarianism can be deepened on liberal foundations, or whether it can be deepened on liberal foundations. The institutionalization of decency depends to considerable measure on how we answer that challenge. It was not just the authoritarian, even totalitarian features of actually existing socialism that proved chastening, but important features of actually existing liberalism. Some of the best features of that tradition, including religious toleration, drawing lines between the public and private, the treatment of citizens as rights-bearing without regard to their values or social attachments, and the refusal to choose between competing conceptions of morality and virtue, that is, a determined principled thinness, leave liberalism vulnerable to illiberal temptations. As I wrote in a book called Liberalism's Crooked Circle, written in the form of two open letters to Poland's Adam Michnik, quote, not without irony, I believe liberalism needs socialism, though not only and not just any socialism, as a partner to provide moral and practical elements that it cannot supply on its own to help guard its crooked circle against illiberal adversaries. But is that partnership possible, or must quests for liberty and equality trade off? Are they antithetical assets? Or are there promising rules of engagement? Answers are not obvious or clear. Writing a critical assessment of the writings of the liberal socialist Norberto Bobbio, Perry Anderson issued the chastening claim that the combination of liberalism and socialism, and I quote, constitutes an unstable compound, which, after seeming to attract one another, must end, this is Anderson, must end, by separating out, and in the same chemical process, the, the liberalism moves toward conservatism, end quote. In this, though, from a rather different political perspective, Anderson echoed Othmar Spahn, the organicist, conservative Austrian philosopher, sociologist, and economist, who as a contemporary to Hayek, likewise thought that socialism, quote, to be an inconsistent medley of collectivism and liberalism. Always or only sometimes? There is no way to be sure. Perhaps better to ask which conditions increase the likelihood of success. Are there some approaches that raise the probability of positive synergies at a moment when, liberal de when illiberal democracy is growing more assertive and when critical orientations to today's political economy within a liberal ambit are too tepid to shift the course of our era's ambitious but rigged capitalism. The term recently used in the Financial Times by Martin Wolf to designate capitalism marked by protected privilege, bruised lives, and the absence of the public good. Combining the language of Eric Wright with that of such 1980s dissident East European leaders as Jacek Kuran and Adam Michnik, is it possible, we might ask, to invent a real utopia of liberal socialism 
that is self-limiting. Only, I think, and now I'm going to say some obvious things, if three sets of conditions regarding both socialism and liberalism are respected. And here, allow me to quote text I wrote a half decade after the end of actually existing socialism. And on these matters, my views have not changed. First, socialism must come to terms unequivocally with the permanent separation of the zones of property and sovereignty, resting content to negotiate the terms of their institutional relationship and degree of overlap. In turn, it should press liberalism for particular conceptions of property as a general inclusive right and as a relational construct that must reckon with the conditions and entitlement of the propertyless and nearly propertyless. Second, socialism must give up the impossible dream of a future entirely without exploitation and scarcity and settle for ameliorative but not necessarily inconsiderable goals, while recalling to liberalism the inherently social qualities of its own cherished norm of human autonomy. Third, socialism must recognize the indispensability of the distinction central to liberal citizenship between public and private spheres. In so doing, however, it should remind liberalism of its own doctrinal commitment to understand and regulate the public aspects of putatively private activities and insist on a robust extension of liberalism's understanding of the scope and content of what counts as political. These preferences appeared in the first of two open letters I composed to Adam Michnik a letter I called La Lutte Continue. It ended, as will this talk, with these questions. Social Democrats in the past erred on the side of pretentiousness in declaring ultimate aims, but were, not too, but were too temperate in identifying means. Today, faced with the right wing's capture of the meaning of 1989, they have lost ambition and initiative. Can we do more than hold our breath while witnessing the onslaught, of the, well, on the onslaught on the welfare state, the campaign to install an unbridled capitalism as humanity's highest goal, and the crusade to eliminate public and democratic counterweights to naked class power? Posed a quarter century ago, these questions, alas, remain pressing. In the spirit of real utopias, we have no choice but to contend with what the political theorist Pratap Mehta recently designated as our moment's crisis of audacious evil, celebrated for its audacity. Dear Eric, la lutte continue. Thank you very much. Fred? Could you clarify or say a little bit more about the, the first of the questions at the end, the property and what socialists must do in terms of property and sovereignty and what has to be quickly? Well, it was, you know, the hallmark of um, uh, certainly the Bolshevik Revolution to erase totally the, the boundary between property and sovereignty, and to collapse them into one. Um, if one had a one-sentence description of the Bolshevik project, it would be that, um, as a, in their view, a necessary condition to build socialism and then communism. Um, the, um, it's not that we or any of us know anyone uh, who believes that today um, you simply could collapse the two, that nationalize everything, uh, and, and so on. But the, what I meant to say, if I, and if I had a more relaxed time, I would have ruminated about, though I don't know the answers to, um, what I take to be the, uh, a deep, the deep Polanyi puzzle that I hinted at when he wrote about the 
which is how to construct um, a sense of property as what I was calling an inclusive right. Um, how to actually get from where we are to there um, without crippling the, the capacities of the political economy we have based on property and class hierarchy, et cetera, et cetera, and markets um, to function and put food on people's table. Um, and I'm not sure you, uh, you're a great scholar of Polanyi, um, uh, whether he believed that, how much he believed that the insufficient answer to that question of how to relate pro what I'm calling property and sovereignty, property and public authority, um, uh, how much he believed the failure to achieve the right formula not only conduced the crash of uh, 29, or uh, was responsible in part for that, but also that once that happened, the most uh, successful variance to a kind of liberal capitalism uh, uh, turned out not to be on the left, but on the right, the far right. Um, and, and so that's, that's the puzzle uh, to grapple with. And of course, you and a good many others in this room have, including Eric, um, uh, Owen Wright, I mean, uh, 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 sought to grapple with that question. Uh, and I don't know that we yet know full answers to that. It's very striking, for example, <coughs> that the most successful social democracies we know um, uh, were, if you like, deeply respectful of property. Um, uh, uh, I mean, Swedish social democracy is based on a very strong capitalism um, in, in, a, in a very partic a particular variety. Um, and uh, so we, we're, we're bereft of examples. Um, uh, I think this is our tragedy. Um, uh, we have theoretical examples. Um, we have great theorists of uh, what I'm calling liberal socialism, or Rosselli called liberal socialism, in political economy, but very little achieved practice. <coughs> yes, yeah. I'm, I'm a Did you explain if you recognize, if you acknowledge the difference between liberal socialism and democratic socialism? Not necessarily in the way that the words democratic socialism have been used lately, but according to more traditional understandings of what democracy is talking about, real popular control. Yes. Because I'm a little bit unclear about what you mean by liberal. I understand it's not that it's liberal means not illiberal, <coughs> but what the positive content of it is is not entirely clear to me, and it can. Everyone in this room should know that ever since I was 18 years old, when I would say something in a classroom as a freshman at Columbia, Andy Levine would say, I don't understand what you just said. <laughs> <laughs> so this is um, when, when the truth was that it, it, when we took our liberal, our, our humanities class, it started with the Iliad, um, he was the only guy in the class, I thought, who ever understood what this brilliant teacher of ours was saying, Angus Fletcher. And I thought, I don't understand what he's saying, but never <laughs> mind. That was a compliment. And never mind. Um, uh, look, excellent question. Um, it really has two parts. Do I distinguish liberal socialism from democratic socialism? And what do I mean by liberal in liberal socialism? Right? Fair? Um, I, I said it too quickly in passing. I, my, my reference to liberal here is actually identical to Rosselli's, which is a political liberalism whose central conceptions are rule of law, government by consent, individual and public rights, and political representation. Now, you can find um, a predecessors to those ideas in other traditions. Um, you can find debates about this, but at least some versions of political representation in republicanism, for example. Um, let's not go there right now. But absent at least those four um, features of a political reality, what Rosselli, what I'm prepared to call political liberalism, doesn't exist. Um, those are the minimum conditions. Now, liberalism itself, understood politically in those terms, um, seems to me to have two 
interesting um, and not often remarked on enough features. One, it was a statist, from the beginning, a statist theory, that it was, it, it was premised on the existence of strong sovereign states. And the question would be how to organize those regimes, the regimes in those states, so as to prevent rulers from acting in a predatory way against the people they govern. So in that sense, liberalism is a theory of, um, I don't want to just say negative liberty in, in Berlin sense, but something like that. But notwithstanding, from the beginning... It's a theory of limited sovereignty. What's that? It's a theory of limited sovereignty. It's a, it's, it's a theory that accepts the indivisibility of state sovereignty while seeking to tame it. That's the way I would put it. And if we want to call it limited sovereignty, I don't think it's quite, I don't like that. It's that there are things that the sovereign can't rightfully do. The sovereign yes, there are things the sovereign cannot right, rightfully do. So now, to come to your democracy question, the... The question is, I'm sorry to go on so long, but it's a fundamental question. And here we get to democracy. If the sovereign, if the things the sovereign cannot do, are there things legitimately the people, and only whoever they are, the, the member people can do? And you have the growth of popular sovereignty, the idea that you see it already in, in Hobbes in terms of the constituent power of the people to make a regime, but then, then it stops. Once you have the regime, good luck, goodbye to the people. With Locke, it's a form of parliamentary sovereignty. Then goodbye to the people, except in a revolutionary circumstance. And in the American Revolution, um, say, the people achieved, those who qualified, white men, um, had a more agonistic and permanent role in the polity. So you have a kind of the growth of the possibility of mass democracy. But the question still remained for democracy, would it be tamed and limited by the core conceptions of the liberal tradition? So yes, we could talk about democratic socialism, um, but I, I believe it's not the same thing as talking about liberal socialism, and a decent socialism requires both. Yes. Um, so what, I, what I'm getting is that you need by liberal so socialism, uh, a left that is not authoritarian, right? Um, but there's also kind of like a backdrop of like, oh, okay, well, if there's a left that is going to heavily um, put restrictions on wealth, it has to be authoritarian. I don't think that's true. And I'm wondering if like, you would consider that maybe decentralizing power from one individual and having more uh, diverse like municipalities with bigger powers, that would be a way to limit um, authoritarianism while also uh, putting a control on capitalism. That's a great question. And the, of course, I don't know the answer. Um, uh, but let me just say that I'm prepared <laughs> to say, and many in the room may disagree with me, that if we take just the two <coughs> words, liberal and, and socialist, um, use a kind of Rawlsian kind, it has to appear in a lexical order in which liberalism commands. That is, we've, we've seen non-liberal socialism. And it was a catastrophe. Hold on. Um, uh, uh, then the question, would be, you're asking what I take to be an untested empirical question. Um, and I would love to see it tested. To what extent can we, through the instrumentalities of what in effect is state policy, and as our, our colleague Jane Mansbridge at Harvard says, any state policy is a form of coercion, um, how far can we move in a direction to transform both the production and distribution of wealth and income without violating? <coughs> what? That, yes, I say, do. Is that for Rosselli that was clear? If we do what Mussolini did, we will have fascists and we will protect us. But then, if we have those elements which we pride ourselves in having, it's not clear either what would fill them. I think it is part of your question. What do we fill them with? At what level do they start operating in a way that truly expresses uh, the democratic way? So the, the, the question is too fundamental, really, to, 
to have a quick and inevitably glib answer. Um, uh, but, but let me just say, say this. Um, uh, you, look, you know far more about Rosselli than I. So uh, uh, the, uh, Rosselli, uh, his movement, um, was, of course, an anti fat exactly right. It, it was what we need to stop this depredation, the depredations of Mussolini and, and his thugs. Um, uh, but that question, um, and it was what, sometimes in, in, during the day today, I thought this was the kind of question we elided about things don't always get better. Sometimes things get a lot worse. Um, and that any kind of decent real utopia, as it were, um, has to not only reach for something that is deeply just, more just than what we have, that's the meaning of utopianism, and the real comes, or for Rawls, the word realistic, is that it's not so distant from what we can do that we can't imagine the better. So that was, that's the sensibility, but at the same time, simultaneously, that ambition has to go hand in hand with the realization, which has been validated over and over again, certainly in the last century, and certainly today, that um, we need a realistic utopianism that prevents things from getting worse. In his case, it was the, the actually existing fascism. Um, so the test of a successful, in this case, liberal socialist left, for us, it seems to me, is not simply how much it makes better, but how it can provide an appealing, democratically appealing, and legitimate alternative orientation to the, what I believe, I know you believe, to be the meretricious and phony but sales pitches we get about alternatives that not only help reinforce privilege, but also bring liberal democracy um, under great stress. Um, yeah. So people have asked, and you've explained, that the liberal part of liberal socialism but, you know, then we have to ask, well, but how are you understanding socialism? Now, I mean, a minute ago, you know, you said we have experienced non, uh, 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 undemocratic or, you know, non-liberal socialism, and that was a disaster. And of course, you know, but state socialism in the statification of all property uh, has been objected to by plenty of socialists on socialist grounds. Right, you know, socialism can mean it often has meant autonomy, right? It can mean and it has meant uh, a true universalism, right, and not nationalism. All the state socialisms were very nationalist there, too. You know, it seems you're referring it mostly to property, um, you know, but I again, so I, what, what is the socialism part that you know, the liberal? Let's spend the next four hours yeah. in discussion. Um, but the so uh, I said the minimum condition, and then we can talk about options. The minimum condition, and I, I once had this long conversation, uh, alas, not every Sunday with Eric, um, but I remember a very long walk um, in which uh, your, a version of your question was on the table. What's the irreducible minimum? that you would have to call socialism. And the, the answer, there was no the answer, the, um, is uh, a profound egalitarian thrust, um, which um, involves, realistically, um, grappling not only with abstract ideas like human autonomy, and which we find in liberalism as well, um, but with um, hard-nosed questions of the organization of political economy. Um, so not just property, not just the machinery that generates wealth and poverty, but absent grappling with those questions, it's very hard to think of the meaning of the word socialism. Um, uh, it's not just a, a kind of, um, I don't know, early Marx on steroids. Um, uh, so it, 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 it and, and that's where the hard questions start, because we have, as you say, David, 
remarkable array of appealing and less appealing, but intelligent and less intelligent, of socialist theory. We go back um, certainly to the 1840s to the present, um, you know, nearly two centuries of, of socialist uh, theorizing. But of actually existing socialism, but this I don't only mean Bolshevism, we don't have much, frankly. Um, and uh, so we're, we're in this gap, huge gap. So when you ask, what is socialism exactly? Um, I don't know. Um, uh, what I know is that it has to be a zone of experimentation and contestation about how to manage a series of zones that seem to generate high inequality. It includes, of course, questions of political economy. But not only that, it includes questions of the organization of social space and um, who gets to live where and not. Um, not just work, but home issues. It includes uh, questions of um, uh, the egalitarianism, as it were, of cultural expressions of uh, uh, potentially, or forms of human expression as connected to questions of work and home. Um, and it certainly must include, um, at some point, um, a marriage with the civic, active human capacities to self-govern, both democratic and democratic as constrained by liberal principles. Um, and when it doesn't mean approach all of those things, then it's a very incomplete um, social, political, and economic theory. Sure. Uh, if you'll indulge a metaphor, um, so you've been going into the lab or reading the lab reports for a century, all these little petri dishes, nation states, have masking tape on them, and, and if it says liberal socialism, when you come back in, they're always spoiled the next day. A disaster, right? And so you're so discouraged. You've looked at all these petri dishes. Well, what if it turns out that sort of the, the ghost of the avatar of the Monopoly game has been sneaking in at night and looking at the petri dishes? Whenever they start to look promising, fiddles them up or dumps them out. Um, what I'm thinking of are you know, Guatemala, Chile, these countries that maybe have a shot, but I think your discouragement assumes that something happened in the petri dish. But what I'm saying is, well, maybe actually there's a there's a global reason why the most promising experiments have been failed, as opposed to internally failed. Well, well said. I actually not only agree with that, but I think it's not just the um, the American-led imperialist capitalist world. Sure. Think of uh, Prague in 1968. Um, uh, okay. There was an experiment: socialism with a human fail, a liberal socialism, right. explicitly a liberal socialism of Dubček and and all. Soviet army rolled over it. America in uh, uh, Allende's Chile, um, uh, America, we, we rolled over it. Um, uh, so, so the point, the point is right, but it still leaves us with the, with the, with the empirical dilemma of, to use your image, of the, what was growing in the petri dishes not growing to maturity. And, um, and therefore, um, we're stuck with, um, uh, that doesn't mean we should lose heart. It doesn't mean we shouldn't struggle. It doesn't mean we shouldn't define our values and fight for them. Um, but it does mean that we have a problem of not being able to say, look here, here, and here. I, you know, for a long time, my colleague at Chicago and um, John's a, a colleague and perhaps teacher as well, Philippe Schmitter, wrote a lot about different forms of corporatism. And he had Austria and Sweden and Germany and, you know, there are a lot of varieties of corporatism. Mussolini's corporatism. Um, uh, you, could, you could assess and compare. Um, and in real terms, the a kind of hijacking, if you like, of socialism, or it's hijacking to illiberalism, um, maybe it wasn't inevitable either. I mean, you can argue that case. Um, you, could, you could take a Trotskyist position or whatever. But however it happened, the hijacking was so profound, the killing fields so bloody, um, that um, uh, 
we don't have there. Um, uh, that really worked in, uh, in northeastern Poland. Let's do it. Um, uh, so that's, we are bereft in that way. Um, and, 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 and that, that quality um, charges us to more real, real and realistic utopianism, <laughs> to more pragmatism, and to more of sensibilities of at least let's defend the best of what we have, um, all of the above. Yes. Yeah, in the <coughs> British case and the Russian case, the socialism was part of reconstruction. And I think that's a negative starting point. That's a framework that starts with the negative. Whereas utopias that we know in fiction and in reality, they're come upon. Uh, in Hilton's Conway, Shangri-La, oh, it's there. Even Martin Luther King, I have a dream. It's there. Uh, Audrey Gulliver, it's there. I think there's a, a, a circumstance where you have a a built-in negative because of the way the origins have developed. Because reconstruction is a dirty word in American history. The fact that it's it's you know it's a trauma and it's also a destruction where the socialism has to pick up the heavy baggage and develop its society. So I think that's the difference between the dream utopias that I know about that I see, where they never talk about what it came from that destruction and the blowback from that, that would be. Whereas the failures of the examples that we know from history have that dynamic. This is a very good question. And a really interesting counterfactual would be, which we don't really have, let's imagine um, a, a, a socialist construction um, under conditions not of uh, following decimation and deep war and austerity and the like, but under conditions of plenty. Um, but then, um, uh, just as a historical empirical matter, um, the transition, and as our, our old colleague and friend Adam Jaworski used to argue, any transition to socialism is going to involve a trough. Um, uh, under what conditions, under what democratic conditions will the people opt for that trough um, if it has not been forced on them as a result of um, the decimation of war? And um, we don't know the answer to that question. Yet one more question we don't know the answer to. <laughs> Hi, Rob. I'm so impressed, as always, by your erudition and the logic, you know, the compelling logic of what you said. But, I can't but I'm wrong. <laughs> No, I think that's a that's a great, and I'm I don't mean to be the pessimist. Um, I, I I mean to be, um, I don't say the realist. Um, first of all, I, I I confess to a to a to a series of passionate commitments. They're not very different than Eric's. Um, Eric, he wouldn't have, he never said I am a liberal, um, but Eric believed in um, uh, all those values that I identified with liberalism. He lived that life. He taught that way. He, uh, the whole process of his being was a commitment. He hated authoritarianism. He was the most egalitarian, inclusive person I think I've ever known. Um, so I'm prepared to say, if you'll forgive me, Eric Wright was a liberal. Um, <laughs> but we certainly know that Eric Wright was a socialist. Um, well, hold it. Yes. Um, I, 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 I telling a tale out of school. I once was in Lawrence, Kansas, and had a conversation with Eric's mother, um, who was, um, in effect, describing him as an optimist from two years old. You know, I mean, there's a kind of uh, joyous, um, a realistic 
he, he knew what was wrong in the world, but a sense we can do it. Um, uh, he could do it with a first year graduate student who, I won't say was barely literate, but, um, uh, <laughs> but, 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 but not deeply educated. And by the time Eric was finished, that person would be a rigorous, systematic, um, informed, well-read thinker. There's a kind of genius there, right? Um, it's not just optimism. It's, as Joel would say, it's optimism married to hard work, right? Um, and I think where, where, where I would, if, you know, if this were the first of a, God help me, if I, if I were doing another lecture about to answer your question, um, I would go down exactly the same road as Eric because I would say I'm an institutionalist. Um, that is to say, what Eric was passionate about was not socialism as an abstraction. Every one of those volumes in the real utopia thing was institutionalist. It's how can we reorganize institutions to affect probabilities? And if there's a punchline of what I want to say is, when we think about altering probabilities in a generous and positive direction through institutional design, then let's bear in mind not just the socialist criteria, but the liberal criteria. Uh, because that, because absent the liberal part, we know, one thing we do know, is that we don't want that illiberal or non-liberal socialism. Uh, so the question then is, is liberal socialism possible? And it, I didn't ask it as a pessimist. I asked it as a realist. Um, because if we can't get there, then we've made mistakes with institutional design. Um, and it's that configurative logic and an ability Eric had that I certainly do not, is to have the fine-grained institutional imagination to take subjects as different as the six, seven in the utopian volumes. And they're all not, let's not rehearse every book now. They're all different. Um, but they all have a, a kind of nuanced um, imagination of how to build layer on layer of incentives and disincentives to change probabilities of human behavior. Um, that's a skill which I think is unmatched um, uh, uh, and much needed. Um, and uh, I'm jealous because I don't have it. <coughs> Thank you, thank you for your talk. Uh, I, all, I too very much enjoyed it. I too will try to challenge it a little bit. Uh, so my problem was basically that listening along, I didn't hear enough about a socialism that I thought deserved the word. Okay. And here's one of the two the places where I had discomfort. First was the understanding of socialism seemed to focus around distributions of income and wealth. And when you get out the abstract logic of what counts as liberal socialism, you insist on the separation of power and property, uh, public and private, of like imperium and dominum, in those terms. And I think you can't get an adequate notion of socialism if you insist on those things. Because the problem for socialism is not private property as the basis for individual autonomy, where that it can hold, you know, it is fully compatible with a certain kind of the problem for socialism with private property is that private property is a means to subordinate other people. The workplace is a private realm, right? When, some, when a worker enters into the workplace, they enter into the power of somebody else. That power, that person, the employer, exercises a quasi-public power over them. They have a unity of power and property, exactly. And the socialist insight was that this private realm has to be politicized. It has to be a place in which. Say one more sentence. What do you mean by it has to be politicized? It has to be a place where the workers have a say in it. It has to be democratized. It has to be democratized. <laughs> the workers have to have That's a say. That is, the workplace was left out of your talk entirely. Well, it's true. Yeah. All right. Yes, I could. Uh, but um, I think you've made two different points. I agree with one, and I disagree radically with the other. Um, the one I disagree with, for I see no. When I say that um, socialists must live with the fact that property and sovereignty cannot be fused, 
Um, in fact, when property and sovereignty were fused, the democratization of the workplace was not the result. Um, one would not hold up uh, actually existing uh, East European and Soviet workplaces as the model of democratic participation. So I, I think these are two separate matters. Um, hold on. The question, the question, it seems to me, is not whether property and sovereignty should be kept apart, but the terms of their relationship when they are not fused. That's the way I would put the question. And certainly, a democratization of the workplace um, would have to be a critical element. Now, what we mean by that buzzword, democratization of the workplace, is not immediately obvious. Um, uh, it, when we say the workers will control the means of production, um, which workers? What skill levels? With what decision structures? With what hierarchies? I mean, we have specialists on these questions in the room. Um, uh, so yes, um, uh, everything I wanted to say. I, I used a one sentence. I said something like, um, uh, 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 "Socialists must insist that property be an inclusive right." Well, by that I mean inclusive right in terms of democratic governance. Um, uh, but I don't mean um, an inclusive right in which the state owns everything. Um, uh, and it, it, we're in a field of tension here. Um, uh, and the question is how to make that field of tension creative. So I fully am happy to go down. I'll march under your flag about democratization in the workplace, but I will not. I will refuse the flag of saying property itself, any private property, is so corrupting that we must end it. Because when we've ended it, we got another form of corruption. Um, one more? One more. Um, earlier in the day, I, I made mention of uh, how, uh, as a graduate of SDS, uh, I think I share in, in, in uh, having made the mistake of throwing the baby out with the bath. By which I mean, I, I think that we accepted all the descriptions about what happened in the Soviet Union with little or no question. Now there's been research done in the last few decades uh, based on looking at the archival records uh, in the Soviet Union, which begin to reveal a different picture. Now that doesn't mean, oh, gee, everything was wonderful, and the only reason why it would fail because of all the outside you know, pressures, no, no, no. But among other things, I'll use only one example because I'm not, uh, again, I'm not one an academic who's well versed on these things. But one thing I read was that in the late 30s, at Politburo meetings, there was a motion put forward, or whatever you call it, kind of, to the effect that elections around the country should be opened up to other parties. And the reason given was that the, the one party state, you know, a lot of especially the regional, you know, leaders and so on of the Bolshevik party in the various regions, that they were becoming really corrupt. And so the motion was put forward, well, a way to, to battle that or counter that was open up elections that motion was defeated. And I think it was defeated two years in a row, and then World War II erupted. The maker of that motion was Stalin. Who could have thunk it? Right? You know, it, that blew my mind. And all I'm saying is that it's really important for those on the left to stop bearing this heavy, ugly cross of the misinformation. There's enough of the real stuff that went on that needs criticizing and challenging and learning from. I think there's a, a, a number of areas where we have to you know, get the information more up to date and not believe the lies of conquest and folks like that. Well, of course. There are features of Soviet life. There were opportunities offered to people, um, mobility opportunities that did not exist 
in the czarist regime. There were um, uh, there were forms of gains in education. Uh, there were forms of gains in access to health. I can, we can go through a, such a list. But my God, um, how do you weigh that against literally millions, not tens of thousands, the Ukrainian famine, an engineered famine, the Great Terror, hundreds upon hundreds of thousands of people. In the period you're telling us Stalin <coughs> thought about maybe a more multi-party system? Um, I mean, I, I, I think these are incommensurable, frankly. And um, uh, I don't think we can build the left um, out of a reconstruction of the more positive aspects of the Soviet experience. There are, uh, take any regime that we really don't like. Um, uh, take forms of some of the worst dictatorships in Latin America. Um, take um, you know, Mussolini's and Hitler's uh, right wing. I can find you um, various aspects of the management of the economy, of building highways, I, I, trains running on time, um, not like the New York subway um, that, that operated. But we wouldn't go there. Um, so I would counsel um, not a revisionism that says, let's not, you know, let, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but the, um, it, it, it's not a good route, I believe. Um, it may be a, a, I'm not endorsing everything ever said by an anti-communist in order to justify illiberalisms against uh, others. Um, there was a kind of um, manic um, uh, version of anti-communism that um, uh, was deeply illiberal. Um, uh, so if there's anything I, I care most about, it's falsifying the claims to do something better when based on deeply illiberal traditions against the rule of law, against individual and public rights, against political representation, <coughs> against a plural civil society, against government by mass consent, um, as, as verified through uh, mechanisms of renewal. Um, and when you have such regimes, whether they're fascist or Bolshevik, um, we should disdain them. Um, whatever bits of good, sometimes big bits of good, that they accomplished. Anyway, thank you all very much. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you Ira.